we're very excited that um you're joining us today it tells us that you are as interested in the topic as we are so we very much appreciate it and and we are all quite familiar with um ai by now you've probably experimented with some tools and so forth so we would love for this to be more of a conversation than just us talking at you um because when we started talking about um this topic um it, it was very clear that there was a need to explore how ai can influence design thinking and and so um, if you're also thinking that way, then it means that you also may have some ideas. So let's start off um, next. Well, just before you click, actually, if you can go back one. So the topic again is enhancing um, design thinking with AI tools. Enhancing design thinking with AI tools. I'm very excited to do this with Desmond Edusa. Uh, so next, um, I think most people here know who I am. My name is Gordon Edomja, co-founder of Design Thinking Ghana and also Associate Professor at Chelsea University, focused on innovation and entrepreneurship. And basically my, I like to put it this way that I like to put to take a design perspective to the development of new ideas and business models. Um, yeah, next. That's one. Yeah, I guess I'll introduce myself as well. Um, good evening, everybody. Thank you for making the time to join us here today. So um, my name is Desmond Itusa. Um, I'm an innovator and a tech startup founder. And then on the side, I also work as a design consultant as well. So I'm um, a very strong believer in using design as a problem solving tool and approach, and then using it to test the um, limits of creativity and innovation. So look forward to a very exciting session. Thank you. Yeah, you, you're not including your professional degree in design, design thinking. Sorry, <laughs> I apologize. Yes, so um, I have a master, master of design degree in design thinking from Cranfield University, UK. So yeah, there's that too. All right. So we start off by um, you know, projecting what we always start with, the double diamond process. So we normally start our workshops by showing the double diamond model for design thinking, and then we look at applications of it. So here um, as you can see, this is the double diamond model. If you Google design thinking, you'll find multiple models, five step and so forth. We like the double diamond because what it does is that it allows us to really talk through process, right? So very quickly, the double, the double diamond says you have a problem on the far left, you're going to solution on the right. Most people start from the middle and jump to solution waiting for that feedback. So we're saying that the double diamond model, what it does is that it shows us um, the flow of activity in problem solving. Most people will start with problem on the far left and jump, and most people will start from the middle and jump to problem when they, to solution, when they have a problem, ignoring of a deep focus on trying to understand the problem, as you can see on the far left, which is this process of problem scoping, trying to understand the causes and effects, and map the stakeholders so that you have a better sense of who you need to go engage during the research. And then what it does is that it opens the frame so you have a lot of information. And then at this point, you need to close the frame to a point of view or problem definition. 
and the closing of the frame has a number of processes to it as well. We use sense making, and let me know if the audio is okay. For those who said the audio is low, uh, Papa Yu and, and Co. Uh, then we have sense making that helps you narrow down uh, the data inf and information that you're collecting towards a problem definition. And once you have a clear sense of how you should um, solve the problem, you can go into ideation, which is the second uh, that develop here. What ideation does is that it opens up the frame again and you come up with so many competing ideas for what could be the best solution. And then once you have all these ideas, you prototype towards a solution. And that process of prototyping is a process of narrowing down. So we thought that for this discussion, we're going to start and talk about the, the tools and steps that we go through as uh, design thinkers when we go through this double diamond, through the first diamond, which is the pro this problem space or strategy, and the second diamond, which is the solution space or the execution space. So if you take the steps and tools, then we can ask the question, how can AI, how does AI come in at each of these steps as we go along? So design thinking generally is, is for those who are new to it, is defined as a human-centered approach to innovation that draws from the designer's toolkit to integrate the needs of people, the possibilities of technology, and the requirements for business success. And we always say that if you're a researcher or for anybody, design thinking is a problem solving approach. A problem solving approach is typically a research approach. And the only difference here is that you are drawing from the designer's toolkit. So if you focus on that drawing from the designer's toolkit, then you really need, you can ask the question, what AI tools do we need to add or could we add to the designer's toolkit that we use for design thinking, right? So that becomes a, quite a relevant question. So you take the research process, for instance. There are a couple of tools we use here, for instance, the tree diagram. And please, this is where I would love for people to jump in, especially uh, facilitators. How do you see AI coming into augmenting, supporting, making some of these processes easier. So we use, for instance, the tree diagram for problem space mapping and design thinking. We want to understand what the causes are of a problem, what the effects are of a problem. So how does, if you are running a design thinking session, how does AI support you in mapping the problem space? Anybody, what do you see? How can AI improve um, such a tool? This is one that you normally have to draw by hand. And how can AI help you contextualize or Africanize uh, a, problems, uh, a problem scoping sort of? Um... Okay, maybe I'll come in just to get the ball rolling. Sure. Um, yeah, so usually with the tree diagram, the concept of it is to try and get in, into a deep analysis of the problem and not just solve okay. symptoms of the problem. So okay. in this case, yeah. Um, yeah, so in this case where maybe you'd have done, you'd have needed to go out to do an extensive level of research first before um, coming back to frame your problem, you'd, it's something that you could put into, say, chat GPT and then work your way towards some assumptions just based off the information it has. So for example, if children are malnourished, definitely you would have had to go to a malnourished area to actually kind of maybe do some level of research or in order to start first, you'd have just sat in your room to do some you know, assumptions and what you think things are. But now with something like ChatGPT, for example, you could input some of these prompts, uh, prompts give it some context and then kind of bounce off your assumptions and the information you get back from it to help you further define this um, tree diagram properly. Yeah. 
So um, yeah, I think that's for me for now. If anybody has any inputs, questions are welcome as well. Okay, um, just a little input. So um, when, whenever you have to kind of analyze a problem using a tool like the tree diagram, two things happen. One, you have some, or you have some starting understanding or knowledge or information about the problem from your own point of view. Number two, you probably might have gone out to talk to the users or the subject, collected information, you've come back with some understanding. So now with BS and yours, you want to try and break down the problem um, in to, to try and find some meaning or the root cause of it. Sometimes you may find yourself in a situation where all that you have is what you know, but you are trying to see what else could be the reason from other people or from other users. Where AI come in is the fact that there is some sort of crowd reasoning here. In, if you look at the way the AI is structured, um, different, different sources of information grouped together, patterns, and all of those things done with the models they develop, and then it can generate some meaning or can generate some feedback based on the prompt. So I, I want to see it more like a crowd reasoning, crowd that you cannot see, but it's there. So you put in the question or the problem, you generate the right prompt, and the AI model is able to take the information or the feedback from all the information from the crowd and then put it squarely to you. It may make sense if you really understand what you are trying to work on, or it may not make sense if your prompt was not correct, or it may not make sense at all if the information from which the AI is drawing from is, does not fit the context that you are trying to analyze the problem. So those three scenarios is where now you begin to ask yourself, can AI really help me be human-centered or people-centered or user-centered? And um, that is where you, be, you, you now have to start thinking of how you want to approach the whole situation. So this is the letter I, I have in mind I want to just share. Yeah, that, that's brilliant. And um, the other thing it reminds me of is that if you do this, Normally, we do this work in teams and different people will come up with the different things in the boxes and um, cloud um, clouds in there. Now, you're doing this alone, right? You're using a machine to generate these prompts. And, and to be clear, you, would normally would, you normally will generate these as a way of hypothesizing what the causes and effects are, not as a solution, but hypothesis then you will go out and validate uh, these various um, sort of elements that were generated, right? So this is all preparation for research. And so now you can do this as one person. You don't need to do it as a team. And chances are, if the other person is using the same engine, they probably will get the same results. So then we start, we, we ask him the question, where's the creativity, right? Where is the individuality coming together to form uh, a team wisdom in, in that process, right? So then educators or people who are using this methodology, then we say, okay, let's design it this other way. You can use AI at these ways, maybe different prompts so that we can get um, some richness in the, uh, results as we hypothesize towards uh, data collection. All right, good stuff. Next. So it's almost the same thing as what you do with the stakeholder analysis. So again, in preparation for research, we'll normally do a stakeholder analysis to understand who is in the space, what is their level of interest, what is their level of power. And I think along the same lines as we heard, now you can automatically generate some of that you can, you can automate some of that information you can draw from pools of knowledge about stakeholders within a particular problem space and again this is in preparation for research right so 
it gives you a broader sense if you are using AI to generate stakeholders and it gives you a broader sense if you're using it to then categorize that data to tell you who has power and interest and so forth. So one of the things we do in ethnographics research, um, one of the things we do for research in design thinking is ethnographic research. Okay. One thing we do in um, our key methodology for understanding um, uh, understanding re the, uh, our problem space is ethnography. Uh, ethnography designers take took from anthropologists who will spend time understanding um, unfamiliar people groups, as you can see in the pictures, right? So these are anthropologists from the West trying to understand uh, unfamiliar uh, groups. Uh, uh, um they have encountered a lot of uh researchers even in industry if it's nike researchers trying to come up with a new footwear um unilever researchers come trying to come up with a new shampoo um, oh, kinds of researchers what they what they normally do is that they will pause their understanding of market segments so they'll take their market segment data that they've collected over years and say, let's assume that our market segments are unfamiliar people groups. Let's go out and try to understand how they are oiling their hair, how they are getting rid of dandruff, how they are, um, you know, whatever the problem is. So you go in assuming that you don't know these people and you try to either reset your insights um, about that segment, learn new things, um, get new knowledge and so forth. So how does AI, how can AI now help us do this better, right? Um, I would, I would just, and here we're also getting feedback to see if people have ideas, but when we're discussing this, one of the things we're talking about was now there's a lot of automation of data collection. I saw um, some information that said that airlines are increasingly using, um, airlines are increasingly using uh, face recognition and other AI tools to uh, check people in at airports, especially in the US and other places, and provide all kinds of service. Now, if we have um, AI bots collecting safety information, um, that in many ways is doing what one of the tools of ethnograph ethnography is observation, right? Watching people and trying to understand what they are trying to do. We always say that, you know, in ethnographic research, there's one goal. You're trying to understand what people are trying to do. Because in understanding what people are trying to do, you get a good sense of what compensating behaviors they are implementing. And it's in understanding these compensating behaviors that you, you get insights to then design for them, right? So somebody is using a particular tool to overcome a problem and you say, oh, then we can design something for them. Somebody is using a particular way to do something and then you say, oh, well, then we design something for them. So how can AI, um, how can AI do better in um, sort of getting us this original information? Let's get some, some reactions from the, uh, the how can AI do better in helping us gather data using these tools? Hi, Dr. Sagodi. Um, Emilia here. So Hello. I think, um, obviously, like you said, AI has its, its advantages and disadvantages. And but in terms of gathering data, um, I think, so I've seen, it was very interesting. So I've seen this, this prompt, this trending prompt on social media where, 
people will say, ask AI to, in the voice of somebody else. I'm sorry, I'm still in the office. Let me close the door. Um, so I've, I've watched these things where they'll say, oh, tell AI that in the voice of all, um, it should respond to this question as if it was, that is one interesting way to get uh, feedback as if you were speaking to that person in real life. So um, I'm almost tempted to say that in depth interviews, where you need certain personas or you need certain target audiences to speak to, um, and I've tried it. I'm not good at AI prompts, so I, but I thought I got some very interesting responses where you almost tell the AI that you are, and then you would put the persona down. You're 41 years old. You live in in a greater suburb in in Accra, and you have a nine to five. You have this. You have that, and then you would you would basically build the persona in AI and then ask the questions as if you are having a depth interview with that type of person. Um, and I thought it was very interesting. I saw it, I watched it, I tried it, I had interesting results. So um, yeah, that between that and controlled experiments, some of the ways that I've seen it being done, very interesting ways. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. That's really interesting. So this idea of generating um, the personas and then mm -hmm interacting with them right is that the idea yes 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 and then interacting with so, them as if and the idea is that ai will um, apparently be able to embody this persona enough right. that they would answer the questions as if they were that person so so it's almost like um running simulation so so this idea that um this one can you go back one so this idea that um in the past um, these folks would travel to these places, these anthropologists would travel to these places and um, try to observe people, interview them, and so forth. So now what you're saying mm -hmm. is now people can create personas mm -hmm. of people or um, market segments or archetypes or target groups that yeah. they want to interact with. Mm -hmm. And then um, proceed to interact with them uh, to try to get gain new insights uh, without necessarily going to the field or doing that as a a process a, 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 a hypothetical process before they go to the field yes um, I have my own reservations about that type because I feel like May, I'm sure the very soon AI will be at that level where it really can be that level of representative. Now, a lot of the answers I find to be funny and I, it doesn't seem very realistic, but I do think that there'll come a time when, yes, it, 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 the, the technology will be advanced enough to really answer as, as if they were this person. That is great. That is great. And mm -hmm. again, I think you had said something earlier about making sure that your prompts uh, uh, good, right? I, somebody was telling me this afternoon that they use AI to uh, answer a quiz and they got it all wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, 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 so there you go. You know. But thank you so much, Emily. Uh, Eugene. Yeah. So, um, just to contribute to the question, I think um, what I've observed is if you really AI can really be a very helpful tool when you you have these two things right from the word go. Number one, it is a tool, just like a brush. I am the one directing the brush on what it should think or what it should do. Then number two is garbage in, garbage out. Once you understand it that way, it can be really helpful. Having said that, you also need to keep in mind that the AI being a tool must work with you, the human being, to generate the kind of results you want. And that comes back to the prompt generation. What I notice is when you engage AI in a conversation, you get better results. So for example, if you compare these two situations, hello, give me the situation where someone is farming and like, tell me a story about someone who is farming and has encountered a reptile. That's a very straightforward instruction. Compared to, hey, um, can you imagine the scenario of someone who is farming? 
the AI response, then you go back. What do you, what are the, what could happen if that person um, encounters a snake? The AI response, then you go back. What if it was another reptile? Then you go back and say, I want us to create a story following this conversation of a man who is farming and has encountered a reptile. And, you know, you go, you, you feed in that, you know, you realize that you start having better responses because you have kind of established a certain line of conversation that the AI model is able to follow through. And it is, it's not too different from when you have conversations with a real human being. You go to the field, you engage the users, you have conversations, they get what you are trying to find out and they're able to respond. So you, you you get better results from the AI. So once you have some of these things at the basic understanding, then you can get better results with the AI. But that AI cannot replace you because um, when a human being says, I know the seed top crowd in, in a user interview, you as a human being understand it in, in a much deeper way than an AI will understand I know the seed top crowd. So stop. The AI is just a tool. It can't replace you, the human being. It can only help you get better and faster in what you are trying to do. If you understand the, the basic things I mentioned earlier. Yeah, this is interesting, uh, Eugene, because what you're you're, talk, you're talking about, you're talking to the point of empathy, right? This idea of can AI empathize? Can it empathize effectively in the uh, research process? Will it pick up on the cues? Will it pick up on all the nuances? Will it be able to do follow-ups? Even though, like Emily shared, we can create a persona using AI and give a voice and do an interview with it. But will it be sharp enough to um, sort of, uh, you know, give you the nuance that you want? Um, you know, so so that's that that that's quite interesting. And um, but to your point as well, and I'm sure other people will share this. That I think for us, the point is that if you take these methods, they are data and information is being automatically collected at a higher rate than um they were before. Um, I remember a couple of years ago when we have students take Twitter data um, about a particular event, use a hashtag to collect sentiments uh, for sentiment analysis, whatever we think we thought that was like mind blowing, right? Now you can use AI to collect sentiments data. You can think of how, how powerful that is, you know, but then the question is, can it, can AI do empathy? Right? Can it be as empathetic, or where do you draw the balance? And it'd be good if you know people can jump in here if they want. Um, but let's let's one, let's go. So this is AI research. The question here is how AI helps us with research. Now, this one, I don't know if you want to speak to uh, Copilot and Copy AI about how they um, help with research. Okay, so um, I believe as some of the points came up. The context, the context here is just how much can AI do? And obviously there are a lot of different tools. There are a lot of different resources that you could use depending on the model that the AI is based on. Some seem to be a bit more empathetic than others and all. But I believe here it's where um, we highlight that um, AI is a tool. It's not a replacement for the person. It's not a replacement for you, the person doing the research or the person you would be interviewed, but it's a tool to help you make your process so smooth. Yeah, at least reduce the action to shorten how much time it will take to get some of these things done. So um, there are a lot of them, but personally, these are two that I have interacted with on different levels. So Copilot is the Microsoft's version of ChatGPT, for example, which is actually based on ChatGPT. So um, in terms of problem framing, researching, it's more reliable than ChatGPT because it can actually give you references for certain materials. So for example, 
if you're doing desktop research where you'd want to find certain articles and certain materials, Copilot is likely to give you a more, um, should I say, accurate response on certain things compared to um, ChatGPT as it would also add in certain references or links that you could click to also go and kind of confirm what it's saying or further research if you need it. And right now, ChatGPT is like the overarching monarch right now in terms of AI. So everything from researching, stakeholder mapping, um, even if you've done if you've done your um, university thesis, for example, you know sometimes the research questions are some of the biggest things in the in before even starting your research. So even helping you frame those uh, research questions and then integrating them into what kind of interview or survey questionnaire should you kind of utilize to be able to get the responses that you need. Um, each of these three can help you with that, but ChatGPT would likely be the most versatile of the bunch. And then with Copy AI, it's I believe it's not as popular as the other two, but um, it actually tends to give more personalized responses on certain things. So um, I believe right now, if you go into, um, say you generate something with ChatGPT, and it starts, it's starting to look very, you know, AI generated. There are a lot of, I mean, you go on LinkedIn, you see that everybody's something always starts with, I am thrilled with this, or I'm excited about that. And it's kind of uh, a peek into the fact that, yeah, this might be AI generated. But Copy AI seems to have a bit more, um, it seems to have a better understanding of certain context and make whatever generation seem more personalized and you know, um, more human-like, so to speak. So these are just um, tools, again, lots. I'll share a resource later that you could get access to, I think a few hundred of them that you can play around with and see which one works for you based on your use. But yeah, this is just an overview of what AI and some tools can be used to achieve some of these research goals. Okay, over. All right, next. So again, um what we started off doing is say take the double diamond go through and say for each stage what are we trying to do as as design thinkers and what can ai do there now for analysis a lot of it is based on visualization right so we have a lot of data and we're narrowing the, narrowing it down through synthesis and that synthesis we do a lot of that through visualization for instance, it's an affinity map, which is trying to generate trends from a bunch of data. So you uh, group them. Uh, there's a whole elaborate process that is involved in this, you know. Yeah, I think Prof dropped off. Um, okay, then I'll just pick up from him until he comes back. So um, yeah, so as Prof was saying, in the previous section, you would notice that, yeah, we are talking a lot of research there's a lot of data being generated. There's a lot of insights being generated as well. But when it comes to analysis here, you are starting to group these things. So you'd notice that on the board, there are a number of different posted notes where if it wasn't say categorized like this, it would look like a number of random different posts. But as you start to cluster them, you start to see where there are sections that can be gamified. There are sections that can be analyzed. There are sections that are more talking about the user's frustration of certain things, and it helps you to kind of structure the information that you generated from the previous section. Um, I believe Prof is back. Okay, sorry, my internet dropped. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. All right. So, over. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. Um. So just going on to next. So here we're not going to spend too much time. We're just trying to. Uh, show examples of how we do use visualization. Uh, go next. Next. Next again. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a mind map, for instance, or visualization from a bunch of research data. Could be interviews. It could be, and and in fact, there was there was software for doing mind maps uh, way before ChatGPT and all these AI tools came onto the scene. So now you can imagine what can happen if you feed transcript or uh, transcripts from say 20 interviews to an AI tool and you say, generate a mind map for me, right? Um, what will happen? Next. So here, another uh, 
another um, a graphic here is a, a, a mind map, which, uh, not a mind map, uh, an empathy map, which pulls out uh, specific things from the data. It could still be a bunch of uh, transcripts and you're saying, can you uh, pull out what people are thinking and feeling in this in this transcript. Can you pull out what people are hearing in this in this transcripts? Can you pull out what they are saying and doing what you can, what they are saying? Can you pull out their pain points uh, just by doing text analysis and so forth and uh, any emotive codes that are in the text analysis? So clearly, you can see how AI can do this faster. But the question then remains: Is faster better? Is faster empathetic? Is faster even true, you know, and, and correct. Next. This is an example of an um, empathy map. Next. And I think Emily shared earlier that uh, there's a tool that she saw that was used to create a persona. So here in this example, this is an example of a persona, somebody you want to spend, you want to solve a problem for. Right, an archetype from your research um, that you say, all right, this is the 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 target narrow target group that we want to solve a problem for. Sometimes we identify a persona, and when we solve a problem for a persona, it unlocks the solution space for us. Right. So once we've developed this archetype, and remember, it's not the average; it's an archetype. Once we develop this archetype, then we can profile the person. So here on the top, um, you know, and, and some additional information, personality and so forth. So what we're asking here is how um, AI can probably do this better, right? And faster, um, but will it be accurate <laughs> and good? And, and if, you know, and then you, I think Eugene said it earlier, you ask the user of the AI, how well can you create prompts and, and tweak prompts to create this kind of stuff for you in a better way? The journey map is not very different where you have, uh, you're trying to uh, provide a, a journey for the persona that you've created. So you have a persona you want to solve a problem for and you set out to understand what their life looks like before, during, and after the problem experience so that you can identify gaps and opportunities for innovation. Again, how will the AI do this and do this better? Next. So this list is a list of uh, different visualizations that we normally use to narrow down um, information to get to a clear point of view that will be the, our requirements definition, pointing us to what the solution should be, what the solution should have. So again, all of these tools, all of these visualizations have AI um, tools that can do them and do them well. And I think uh, that's when you have a list somewhere, right? I, I think it's on the next, yeah. So I don't know if you can maybe talk briefly about um, how some of these tools, and I think you had an example also. Yeah, um, the usual suspects, basically. So um, again, I believe as was mentioned earlier, these tools are just, um, these AI tools are mainly just tools that work based on the prompts that you give them. So at this section of your process development, um, at least you would have been able to generate some insights or you'd have been able to generate your persona. If you haven't, you can feed whatever data you have or what assumptions you generated into these tools to help you to actually personify them, to put a context or a name to them or a face to them, so to speak. And then to, you can even utilize this to also generate um, a customer journey. So for example, if um, I'll share in the case study if we have time, but for example, if you are doing an initiative for um, maternal health, for example, if maybe you are someone who's not a mother, it might be difficult to understand some of the context in which um, some things would be relevant or some things would be important. But here you could kind of generate some assumptions based on whatever idea or uh, problem you are looking to get into and then help 
AI could help you kind of um, refine these. And if you have any data or you generated any data from the previous section, you could use these tools to also synthesize this and generate personas that you could also identify with. Where now, if you are to go out and now do some research, uh, you know exactly who you are looking for. And then um, I don't believe has been mentioned yet, but the thing about the design thinking process is it's very iterative. So it's not a one, two, three, four process. You could do the research, come to analysis, and then go back to research again if you want to find more information or more data. So it's a very iterative process. So the parts that we got really excited about, um, from here, we generate a point of view, which basically um, won't spend too much time here. So uh, that's what we're going to uh, gloss over. But the point of view basically is the arrival points from all the research. It is in the middle of the double diamond. It is, uh, it's the transition point from the problem space uh, into the solution space. And the point of view has a formula user plus need plus insight that basically tells you what you sh what the solution must do, what a solution must have next. Um, and once you have a clear sense of what the solution must have, it has, this is a formula, so to speak. Once you have a clear sense of what the solution must have, then you can start ideation. Um, this one, can you roll over to the ideation methods? Right, so, um, and, and I'll hand this back to you here. So, and and here we have these ideation methods. What is, what are the, what role do they play in design thinking? They play the role of pushing you outside the box. So this idea that as humans on our own, we don't jump outside the box in creating solutions to problems. Even when we have a clear sense of what the point of view is, even when we have a clear sense of what the requirements are. And so in design thinking, we have these games that we play with, um, we have these games that we, that we play with participants so that they can get outside the box, right? So after all the research, we still will do uh, use tools like Disney's three rooms, triggered brain warming, uh, brain walking, semantic intuition, worst idea where you take a, um, a point of view and you come up with the worst idea possible and then you flip it. You flip it from worst to best and then it gets the juices flowing. So now bring in AI. What does that look like, right? Um, and if you are using AI to do this, what happens to your creativity, you know? Um, so I'll pass it on to you, Des Desmond, and also if maybe other people want to jump in. Okay, great. So, thank you very much. So um, as Prof mentioned, these are just a number of games and kind of resources that we tap into to kind of create limitations and spur creativity in code. Where the common thing is that um, there are some people that are naturally creative and others that aren't. But these things kind of bring out the creativity in people uh, based on the context or the conditions that you're given. So, um, for example, this is the Disney Three Rooms, where basically you'd have um, three people in a group, one person to act as the dreamer, the person who should go crazy, think of all the crazy ideas and all, the person who is the realist to be the more logical person to say, this doesn't make sense, this is not possible, this is more likely to be done than the others. And then, of course, you have the hater, the critic, who is supposed to be the, the against person, so to speak, where this thing wouldn't work or their, their job is just to poke holes in it. And then here, by actually um, kind of categorizing people in this or putting people in these frames, they are able to bring out certain parts of them that it's like, if you weren't thinking about how realistic the solution would be, how far would you be able to think? If you weren't thinking about how to make this work, how far would you kind of poke holes in it? And then I believe that goes straight into the colored hats method. That's also a similar thing where in a group of five or six, you'd have people playing different roles. And this is the kind of um, ginger conversations and discussions between people to bring out ideas, critique them and kind of note them down. Um, I'll just gloss over these. So these are, a number of different concepts, but I'd like to just move straight into AI where now um, in the context that, I mean, you're a one-man army or you're one person solving something, or even within your group, 
you could use AI and there are a number of tools where um, here you are trying to see what's what's possible, regardless of whether it's realistic or not. So you are going crazy. You are thinking about a number of things. But here, again, you could use ChatGPT or Copilot. Ask them to be to personify one of these states or one of these other people in your team if you don't have the full team. And then as you are giving them, so say you are acting as a dreamer because usually we have ideas and then we think it's going to change the world. But then you could have ChatGPT act as the, the critique or act as the realist or act as the, the more logical person on some stance. Or even, um, as was mentioned earlier, maybe act like if you had Bill Gates on your team or you had um, Elon Musk on your team. And what kind of insights would come out of that or what kind of critiquing would come out of that? And these are things you could do in the comfort of your home. And then in the same way, uh, once you are starting to get actual, um, let me say, notable points or certain solutions are starting to come up, sometimes framing these solutions to might be a bit of a challenge. So you could have the AIs also create a description for you or to help you create a prompt for your solution or for your idea. Because keep in mind that you can use AI to work out or work on other AIs. So you could use ChatGPT to create prompts for Midjourney, Dali, and the three at the bottom, Dali, Midjourney, and Leonardo are image generation models, which I've also started to include uh, video generation. So what these guys can do, and I'll share an example later, they are most um, they can help you to visualize whatever idea you have, whether it's a product, a business, an idea, um, a website, an app, whatever it may be. These things can actually help you visualize it. I remember there was a very interesting um, story where a guy asked Chad GPT that he has a hundred dollars. He wants to make the most money. How can he go about it? And then this, um, I think it was between Chad GPT and Mid Journey. He was able to start a startup that had pre-orders of I think about $10,000 or $15,000 because he generated the business model and everything about it in Chad GPT, shared all the, like if he's using $5 for something, he lets Chad GPT know what it's, it was, shared the balance and then what else can be done. And then it became a whole conversation. And once he had the product visualization, um, once he had the product idea, sorry, he went, he took it from Chad GPT in the form of a prompt, sent it to Mid Journey to generate um, like product visualizations of it. I think it was a coffee, coffee business or something like that. So in relation to the packaging, in relation to the design, everything was done within Mid Journey. And he built a website out of it using another AI website generator. And in about two weeks or so, he had pre-orders on that website. That was just, I mean, it was crazy. But yeah, so in terms of um ideation yeah there are a lot you can go with it if you want to bounce off ideas you want to try a number of things and again remember that the design thinking process is iterative so if the ideas you are getting here are not kind of going towards the direction of what you want or i mean as usual it might not be in the african or Ghanaian context you could always go back and go back into your research go back into your analysis try and get more information or more data and then come back to work on this again to see if your process is refined and you can do that as many times as you need to. So now to prototyping and it's from here that AI starts to go crazy on some things. So prototyping is basically now that you figured stuff out, you found the best idea, um, how do you want to show it? How do you want, how would you build it? How do you materialize it? Because ideas would usually just be in your head or be in a paper, but then how would you make it something that people can interact with or people can um, actually even give you feedback on. Because if you're like me, sometimes you're talking plenty and you are going far and people are getting confused. But now, if you had a crazy idea, how would you do? So here's, if you were to blow up an MR app AP, just to test it, even if you could afford to, would you do it? And don't just look at this track. It could be a car, it could be a website, it could be anything where if you had the chance to, um, kind of mess it up or have people try it without the risk of it or the risk that would come with the testing, how would you do it, right? Or would you even do it if you could? Because the risk may or may not be worth it. But here with AI, you can just try it and, you know, it has, um, usually it's just digital. So you don't lose as much or you don't risk as many resources. 
So within prototyping, we have what we call the low fidelity prototype. So with low fidelity, you're looking at um, basically it should have the bare or basic fundamentals of whatever you're trying to do. So if you are building a solution or whatever idea you have, what does it look like? What does it feel like? If it's a, if it's an app or a website, um, what would people do on it? So basically here you are thinking about the fundamental interaction. So here you are putting the user journeys that you had previously, you are putting it into context. You are having people embody it. Here you could have stuff like, um, yeah, you'd have um, storyboarding. So if you are into movies, animations, visuals, even trying to create a user journey, you would create that storyboard or you'd have that um, journey that you're trying to simulate. Like um, I was mentioning one of the previous slides. But yeah, basically you'd want to kind of map out what um, people are actually, the experience you'd want people to have. Uh, yeah, so something like this, where you are kind of visualizing that if somebody is traveling, what process would they go through? Would they go to um, a travel agency? Can they book from their homes? Um, what do they need to do? Do they need to print stuff out? What's the process that people would go through? And you can use this as a reference to actually map out how your solution would be. So a very good example of this is if you were to say you have an idea of a food business and you wanted to map out how your food business would go, of course, you could go into chat GPT, ask it all the different details, your personas and all. But then now in terms of your service delivery, how would people get your food? How would you market your business? If somebody places an order, what happens? Or if somebody wants to place an order, what happens or what process does the person go through? And I believe you can see in this context, although we are talking about um, prototyping, we've come back to analysis because that's how the process works. So now after you've prototyped or you've got your low fidelity prototype like this, you can come back to analyze it or share the experience with people, have people go through it and see if they understand it, it makes sense. And then based on that, you generated new insights that you could take back for further ideation or for refinement of your prototype. And then you have also high fidelity prototypes where at this point, usually in low fidelity, you have a lot of ideas you want to um, interact with or play with. But then at high fidelity, you've actually gotten maybe one or two solid solutions that now you want to invest the resources to building. So if it was a website, now you'd actually go into building it instead of just designing it to see whether it's nice or not. But now you are thinking more technical, you are thinking more detailed. If it was the food business, you'd have actually maybe given the details out to a few people for them to try it to see if it makes sense or probably you'd have even um, taken it to, you would have taken maybe some of your food to somebody for them to try it out to see whether it's nice or not. Because maybe what might be nice for you might not be nice for somebody else. A very basic example of this would be if you were to start a baking business, you not, or it's advisable not to go and build a whole like three, four tower cake as a test, as opposed to maybe just starting with a few cupcakes, letting people try them out, get feedback from them before you all go on to build the major and more, um, you know, massive things. So again, in terms of AI, we're looking at um, using AI to simulate the use. So now, you have your ideas, you have your solutions, you have your concepts. You could actually, again, have AI personify somebody, present the solution to them, and then have them give you the feedback. Again, this doesn't substitute you um, actually going to people to get the feedback, but at least here you could start with some of your basic interactions because here, for example, is where the empathy will be needed the most. Some of these things are very subjective. Chase bots are different, context is different. Something that would be nice in Accra or would make sense price-wise in Accra would not be in Kumasi. There are a lot of variables here. But here you are looking at, okay, what's the fastest, um, quickest way I can build something? You can use, if you're building a website, instead of getting a developer, you can have ChatGPT generate some codes for you, HTML, CSS, whichever, then have it, um, you just need to input it in whatever platform you're using without actually going through the developer process or how many weeks or months it may take. This is something that you could build and do within a day or two. So um, there are also, there's this thing called a design sprint in which you take the whole design thinking process and try and go through the entire process within a week. 
because um, I'm sure if you've noticed, the design thinking process can actually be a very, very lengthy process that lasts a month sometimes. But sometimes you just want it, um, if you want to bounce off a quick idea or a quick solution, you can use a design sprint to actually power through a lot of these things within a week and then actually get results or insights after a week. And then you can use it to see if it's worth dedicating the extra months to actually building this more. Um, any questions so far? I know I've ranted a lot, but... Maybe you can show that last picture and then we can get feedback in terms of um, what, what do people think? Um, how are we now going to uh, grow a new generation of chat GPT, uh, not chat GPT, AI design thinkers who know and understand how to leverage uh, AI in generate things, create personas. Uh, we have AI be a companion designer working with them through a problem, um, bouncing things off of this companion because every time you put a prompt in chat GPT, that's, that's chat, chat GPT is your partner, right? So then you are the person hopefully with more empathy than chat GPT or maybe. Um, what, are, what are people's thoughts around that? Can you show that picture of the uh, women uh, program, I think? Um, um, I'll just touch on that. So here, this would be like a typical example for a persona creation, for example, where if you're thinking about a mother with the children, like I mentioned earlier, you could generate the AI or you could use AI to generate some um, visuals to help you kind of see who you are thinking about and then like with prof mentioned um now instead of going i mean getting a designer going all in depth uh, organizing photographers and stuff to get pictures for some of your events you could just um, utilize ai generate whatever composition of image you may need and then get something might not be of course as good as actually taking a photographer to go but instead of organizing the the amount of effort and work it will take to organize, you could do this in maybe a few minutes, right? Yeah, so um, if you look at this picture, um, this is saying Women Entrepreneurs Bootcamp. Um, and you can see it's all black ladies in there. But then you ask yourself, if you invited black ladies to an event, in I think this event is in Accra, right? Yeah, you can see the bootcamp in Accra. If you invite people to a women entrepreneurship bootcamp and they took a group picture, would it, would they look like, would the picture look like this? This picture almost has no colors in it. Um, and it was a lot, the hairstyles are, you know, the black hairstyles, but would, would, would the participants have this much flow? Uh, or how many of them will have, will have, will have flow, right? But, so we look at the picture and you know it's uh, AI generated, but it does the work. It does the work. So in many ways, um, it's like it's being normalized. And then the question then becomes to what extent will this stuff be normalized? You know, are we just, are we going to live in the space of AI versus real and people would just be comfortable with it or, um, you know, in the previous picture, for instance, if you were at a workshop and the persona was speculating, was, you know, coming to the fore and people said, you know, the a woman with, you know, a three-year-old child, then you can just quickly generate this persona and bring it into the workshop, right? Um and 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 it would enhance the results. It's like you you use chat you use uh, AI to bring ideas to life, so people can continue innovating, so people can continue um, creating. So, what are your thoughts around this? The last point I'll make is you know we teach design thinking to all freshmen at Ashesi University, and you know we have a couple of chapters that we take the students through and it's and I had a conversation with the coordinator the other day and we're like 
we need to write something about, we need to give some guidance about how ChatGPT can be rolled into, into uh, not ChatGPT, how AI can be rolled into teaching design thinking. And I'm happy that some, some of the uh, lecturers are here that can probably provide some opinions about that. So let's hear from you. What are your thoughts so far? How comfortable are you involving AI as your design um, assistant, a design partner, um, design interaction, in, in, you know, that you interact with? Yes. Yeah. Um, I'd like to just share the case study as well. Just sure. um, context of I'm the final the time too. So, yeah, yeah just I'll, quick. I'll, I'll, but basically, this was a whole um, concept that was generated directly within AI. So as I mentioned earlier, just um, using AI data, um, AI-driven design thinking initiatives, AI generated everything that I'll be showing going forward. So with the background, with the name Mama Care, and then just through the steps that we did, the stakeholders, all this was generated through AI just with the context of what was given from the previous um, slide. So in the rural areas where my access to maternal care remains a challenge, for example, the prompt here would be what stakeholders would be affected by this. And then within a few seconds, the primary, secondary, and tertiary stakeholders were generated. Where now, if you want to go and do your research, you know where to start from or who to go to. Next, the AI was the persona. So this was, um, this was generated in co-pilot, for example. So in, input the fonts, giving, um, sorry, input the prompt using this um, generation, which came from ChatGPT as well. And then you can start to see how quickly you can frame or personify some of these things within a number of minutes. In the same way, if you're looking at making Mama Care into a company, um, another AI was just used to generate sample logos where now you could just, so in terms of very quick prototyping or very quick testing, generated these um, different logos. You could pick any of them, slap it onto whatever flyer or banner or anything you're doing. And then finally, ideas for websites, for example. So again, all these were just based off the previous prompts that were given, but you could start to see the different contexts where um, these things could be applied or utilized or could actually save you time uh, within this process. So yeah, just in terms of um, an actual example of AI in um, an example case of utilizing AI in design thinking process. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's fascinating. And I think this is what we're talking about this idea that um, AI can become a companion. You know, you can do a simulation all on your own with AI as a companion, bring it in into a workshop series where instead of bringing out an artist in to sort of mock up some of the concepts that are showing up. Um, we did um, a workshop, it was a hackathon, an overnight hackathon with Stan Big Bank staff a couple of years ago. And uh, it was overnight. And so by at dawn, we brought in some, uh, you know, there were graphic artists and coders to come in um, envision the solutions that were popping up from the teams, right? And and they built they built solutions that were then presented later that morning. Um, if we relied on AI, could we have done that uh, as effectively as as we did? Um, was that okay? Um, would it lack empathy? Will our personas look close? to what we want, but not quite. And is that a problem? Are people okay with that? Are they going to be okay with that? Um, what are your thoughts? Hi, this is Ray. Um, I heard you mention- um, Ray. Hey, how are you doing? Bro? Looking good. Good Go on, man. Yeah, so yeah, I heard you mention how um, um, whether we felt it was daunting or whether we felt uh, or whether we felt it would, would be necessary to bring AI into our teaching. And then just as I was looking, I was going through this this presentation, which was very well put together. So thank you guys for that. Um, the, the way I see it is that it's 
it's broken up into three parts here where um, you, you look at design and design supposedly is the, the road itself or the road map. Okay. This, this is how it's supposed to be done. So that's the full process. That's the road. The road is there and it's built. You know what it looks like. You know um, what directions they are. Okay. Then the thinking part of it is sort of like the vehicle. So we have the road, which is the road map. It's in place. It's infinite. Very is blessed. it by internet or is it is Ray breaking up? Okay. All right. So the design part would be the road. Right? Then the thinking would be the vehicle. So that's the thing that we get into the vessel that we use to go around to ask the questions to be be empathetic, to be intuitive, to ask and to seek and to gain more knowledge and to think about it and to regenerate more questions to be able to ask again. Um, and then I think the AI part is more of the possibility. Um, and throughout this presentation, I've seen how, how if it, it's brilliant if you understand the fundamentals and the principles of design thinking, um, and then you use AI to enhance that. Um, so just a typical example would be your affinity map or your affinity mapping. Uh, when it comes to teaching first years um, and new students on affinity mapping, uh, they tend to go out on some sort of, they might take a day or two days to go and do some what we call ethnographic research. And they go out into the public and ask a couple of questions. They get a little bit of info and they come back and they bring it back together. And then they try to develop some sort of infinity map based on their findings. Um, and you find that two days is, is not necessarily enough um, in, in most cases. But there are some cases where uh, students go all out and they do enough research to be able to bring it back and bring it back to a, a board to do um, a, proper, a proper affinity map. But here's a case where if you had or if you were able to initiate AI in the same process, um, you could develop so much more just with a little bit of context. Um, and AI is so easy that you could even take an image as such that the one is being displayed and you could say, identify similar words or similarities within the certain sticky notes and group them into certain tasks and themes. Okay, and you, have, you don't even have to do that with thinking. You can just put that into the AI and it will just group it for you automatically. And that will help you to sort of, um, it just, it's just a more elaborate, more, a faster process where you can, you can execute something like this. And then you can always fact check it. It doesn't have to, it doesn't mean um, you just go by what it's given you. You can fact check based on what it's done. And um, look, AI, we, as much as it cannot be empathetic, um, it can still connect dots. It can still align many things. So yeah, I, I just think in terms of all the applications that design thinking has, the methodology and the process, if you have the fundamentals of that um, as, as a human, um, you can smartly use AI uh, to enhance that process and possibly even get more because I mean at the end of the day you want to do as much research as possible when it comes to your research and when you ideate you want to create as many ideas as possible um, whereas AI will give you that leverage to be able to think beyond um, what you know what the group think is and um, just add just more insight um, to that so and that will in turn get you to start thinking even more so I think it, it definitely enhances the process and, and it's good, um, but it, it's important that the fundamentals come in first. Um, but then when it comes to teaching, I think it's also important. And I think it can help actually um, make the experience a lot more fun. Um, and uh, it, there's a, it could be a lot more learnable in the sense that you could get a lot more done and use that as context and, and, and content uh, to, to phrase your, your slides or to phrase your point of view or um, whatever it is you're trying to communicate across the students. So yeah, that, that's my take on it. And uh, I, think, I think it's definitely something that needs to be implemented going forward. Uh, that's awesome, yeah. Ray, but you need to introduce yourself. Oh, yeah, my name is Ray. Super designer. 
<laughs> yes, yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Ray Panu. Um, I'm a, a creative developer. I run a company called Align Media Tech. Uh, we focus on data development and creative development in Africa. Um, I also lecture at HSC. Uh, I, I teach Foundations of Design and Entrepreneurship. So what uh, we've been talking about here, um, yeah, I, I really love where this conversation is going because um, I think it's important that we, we utilize this tool in a way that is generative. I, I'm of the strong opinion that AI is great, but in Africa, because we don't have enough information out there, um, and we, we, we may run the risk of it generating information for us, um, which, which may not be as accurate as what is currently on the ground. So I think if it's something that we continuously utilize, that we feed into, that we engage with, I think it's the, the, the more the better, and, and it's only going to improve our lives. Awesome, Ray. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Now let's hear from others. Are you looking at this and you're like, hmm, I'm not sure about all this AI stuff. Let's avoid AI. Is that you? <laughs> um, I'm, I'd like to come in with a bit of an input. So, um. I believe Prof, as we're discussing and really getting excited about some of these things, um, I believe Ray also touched on that. Um, AI, I don't think, at least for the moment, AI is here to kind of completely replace anything. It's like um, an additional new tool that can be added into anyone's toolbox. So there maybe here we are looking at it within the context of design thinking and then Design thinking can also be applied in a number of different ways, depending on what you are using it for. So um, design thinking for products, design thinking for organizational developments, design thinking for um, idea generation. There are so many variables. And then adding in AI kind of might seem a bit overwhelming in a number of things because you are learning this while learning that as well. But I believe if in terms of just your current productivity in your work, in um, your own personal hobbies, for example, you could just start playing around with AI just to see what's possible and even factor in personal use cases. Because I've seen people use AI for things that honestly I didn't even think about. And then I've also used it for stuff where people are like, wait, can AI actually do that? AI is going to be something that would become, um, I'm, I mean, it's the fourth industrial revolution, basically. The whole world will revolve around that. So as to how you can use it for your own personal productivity and development, that would be fantastic if you can build it. Otherwise, as usual, um, you might get lost by it because just the points to make that everything we are seeing here in terms of results and possibilities was just done between last year, January, where Charles GPT went crazy. And then here we are. So imagine the next five years, 10 years, maybe, on what AI could possibly be or turn into. Yeah, so I think just a very nice conclusion to some of these discussions. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of people here that I recognize that I think have a perspective on this. It'd be good to hear a few uh, before we close. For me, when I hear about all the great things that AI can do, the truth is, I'm a bit skeptical simply because of the source of the AI and how the data is being kept because we live in a world where, I mean, not to be the bearer of bad news, but we live in a world where everything can be weaponized. So if we saw Russia fighting Ukraine and all of a sudden, I, I mean, I don't take any sides, but... Uh, U.S. weaponized its financial system to kind of cripple Russia, and they use that a lot from time to time, which is fine. However, if we end up being highly dependent on AI that we do not control, maybe we are 
especially we in Africa, if all the AI, well, let's say we get very good at it and it does so much in our industries and our companies and all that kind of stuff. And then maybe one day our our president decides that I don't agree with the policy from here or from there. And one of the sanctions, the AI plug is pulled. Then how many people or how many things will suffer? You know, and it's possible. So I think as since the 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 the, the audience is vast, as we are thinking about what uh, we can do with AI, I think it's also very important to think about building tools or AI tools or AI itself that we own, that we ourselves own from our own databases, because it's a very powerful thing to outsource. It's too powerful to kind of depend on someone in the long term. So I think as we are having conversations about the advantages of AI, we should also think about the, you know, the other side. It's, it, it, it does have advantages, but we need to start thinking of the sources of these AI companies, what they stand for and all that kind of thing so that we don't risk being, you know, at certain, at held at ransom in the future. Please, that's my thought. Thank you. Yeah, so um, I think like in all things, there was always going to be the other side. I'm also a very big advocate of actually localizing things and doing things for ourselves as opposed to depending on what is given to us because, I mean, history always presents itself as when somebody has, uh, I think there's a proverb around it that when uh, basically you're just dependent on somebody or when somebody's, your hand is in somebody's mouth, you can't really bite or something of the sort. But yeah, so um, in as much as we're discussing it in a general sense, I also believe that as we're going forward, dependency or um, yeah, dependency on AI would be one of the biggest issues that will come because even as of now, it's like people are not really thinking anymore because anytime they have a thought, they would go on AI. But then what happens if somebody decides to weaponize it? If somebody decides to, um, I think the Trump and Biden elections, they said they kind of manipulated I mean, that was the rumor or whatever, but they manipulated people's voting based on some of the things they showed them on social media and all. So again, what happens if now whatever we are generating or asking AI for, it's being led in a particular direction or we are being fed misinformation, some of these things. I mean, there would always be that side of it, but I think then the conversation should go how we've seen it's possible, right? We've seen what it can do. With the idea, even open source solutions where some of these things can be reviewed and all. But as always, in the African context, in the Ghanaian context, what can we do for ourselves locally? Utilizing AI, utilizing design thinking, how do we build something for ourselves? Because it's not like we lack the smarts. So, uh, last, last, a lot of us are over there actually doing these works for them, so we don't lack it. But I saw in the chat that. Um, that we still have the digital limitations of AI and all, that then also, yeah, how can we contextualize it, right? There are so many opportunities for us to make our own and not depend on things as we've always done. So yeah, I think it was a good insight and it also shows that on our part, at least just with discussions like this, there's a lot more that we have to do as well. Yeah, it's a really good point. And if you look at the poster with the uh, the women boot camp, it's very clear that the concept of... Uh... A typical African woman and what they look like, the features, the clothing, and all of that is not represented in any of the engines yet, right? So, uh, it's a question of it's a question of who puts them in the engine. Is it by us um, drawing and uploading and and you know? So we need to to look at that stuff as well if we're looking to depend more on AI. Um, are there maybe one or two thoughts before we close? Yeah, I just wanted to add on a few Is it, um, uh, who said it? Before, oh, before Desmond's mark spoke, there was someone also was sending Adusa. Yeah. Um, yeah, just about the fear and, um, you know, whether it will be used to weaponize um, and, and, you know, destroy. Uh, I, I think um, they, they definitely, is that that fear and, and for me uh it's interesting that you brought it up because I, I actually didn't think it was a conversation that we actually 
qualified for at the end of the day because if someone's going to use it to weaponize something, I mean, what do we have to say or do about it, right? I mean, we're just a little guy at the end of the day. Wait, I think your, your audio is cutting out, or is it me? Okay, I'll try and speak with data. I was just, um, just to, to repeat, I was saying that um, in terms of the conversation of it being weaponized and used for no good, um, I, I didn't feel as though we even qualified for that conversation just because we, we are essentially the little guy and um, uh, we wouldn't be able to do much in that regard. Uh, I, I do feel as though um, it, it, it's just it's definitely a perspective of fear which I'm hearing for, for, for the first time from uh, somebody within my group or my community. Um, but I've been seeing more fears around AI in terms of uh, replacing people and replacing human capital, um, which causes a threat to uh, workforce and livelihoods in that way. Um, so it's just interesting to get that point of view. Um, my, my, um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with, with Sora, which just got released a couple of days ago, um, and it's text to video. Um, and uh, it, it, it's quite crazy how how good the technology is in its first iteration, um, and that you know, and that's something that sparked a lot of fear into a lot of creators, a lot of people in the film industry, in the advertising industry, in particular myself, um, who's into advertising and, and, and animation. Um, when I saw Sora, like my heart just dropped because it was like. <laughs> people like work that we've been doing over the last 20 years, people who've been grooming their talent over the last 20 years um, now can be thrown out by somebody who just literally writes text in a box. Um, but at the end of the day, um, it, we, we, we realize that our clients still have very specific requirements and very specific demands that cannot always be fulfilled and met by AI, um, but can be enhanced by AI. So at the end of the day, I think the positive outlook would be to say, look, how do we use it to enhance, not how do we use it to replace? Um, and once you look at it from that enhancement perspective, you can start to look, focus on the positive and see how that can take you from zero to, to, to 10. Um, if it has to fall off some way, somewhere along the line, there's a policy that's drawn that says, put this off, put this on the shelf, at least we would have utilized the tool that could make our lives significantly better um, to develop better human experiences for us all um, going forward, uh, just based on the capabilities of, of this tool. Uh, Kofi, awesome, Ray. That was always great. The use it to enhance, not replace. Quickly was going to close, um, well, process to close it. So, but I wanted to quickly share uh, my thoughts on the fact that, you know, all of this um, AI technology, it's, it's pretty young. Hey? It's just, you know, two, three years into, um, into a, as a consumer product, as a product that's an end user can use. So, you know, think about the first iPhone that came in, what is it, 20, 2007? And now what we have. So there is so much potential for how much this is going to evolve into. And we can't even, you know, at current, think about how, what the tool will look like in, in a few years from now. So let's have that in mind as well. And then I want us to quickly mention that, you know, I had this conversation with Prof last two weeks, but between then and now, my sentiment around how much AI can help us has changed greatly because of the news on Gemini. So if you look at how much of a conversation Gemini is attracted, particularly because it's been programmed in a way that essentially it do not recognize white people, you know? And so when you put in prompts, it just constantly gives you um, black people, etc., and it's overly placed on D, D, E, and I, diversity and inclusion. So again, as a tool, the source of the tool and the people managing the tool could impact on the output of the tool. And with every tool, you know, you will check for who has the best tool and then buy that tool. That same approach to AI in design thinking can also help because if we are not cognizant of the nuisance that these technologies have now, it might defeat the purpose of we attempting to use it to enhance um, design and and design thinking in general. So that's my thought too on you know this technology is really infant, 
and we have no idea what's what is going to shape up to be in a few years from now, as well as as it is a tool. And if you're going to buy any tool from the markets, you want to be sure who the manufacturers are and how they build it, etc. So let's keep these two thoughts in mind. Thank you. Wonderful. Over to you, Matt. All right. Hello. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, it's it's been an interesting conversation. Can you all hear me? Yeah, yeah we can hear you. Great, great. Um, it's been an interesting conversation getting uh getting into listening into most of the latter part of the discussions. Is it's interesting how we can apply AI in all the um phases of the design model. And I think just as the conversation was still led towards the end, Kofi uh made mention of the fact that. AI is very infant and we don't know where it's going to head to us. But the truth is that AI has come to stay with us. So we have to be intentional about it. Uh, I just want to say thank you all for joining us and being with us to the end. And uh, thank you to our facilitators as well. And we are hoping that um, in our next meetup, this is actually the first meetup we are having uh, for the year 2024. And it's been incredible having you all join us and we want to say a very big thank you our next one will be coming up and uh, all the details will be made available to you soon yeah thank you and do have a wonderful evening